Now, at this point, we're going to be applying lighting and shading exactly as I've described. However, you're going to notice on the top left that I have a palette. And essentially what that is, is I wanted to create a palette with four different values, from light to dark, as you can see. However, you'll notice, if you look closely, that they are they're very slightly saturated colors. Blue, red, green, and yellow. And I did the same thing at four different values. And the reason I did this is, the reason I decided to approach it this way was, instead of just applying grayscale and applying color after, I wanted to start incorporating color into the painting early on during this lighting phase to bring a little vibration of color. It's a very subtle, um, it's a very subtle uh, approach to color. It's a bit of an underpainting approach to it. However, I found it gave a, it added that little vibration of color early on that would help me inspire me later on in the painting. Okay. You can of course work straight from grayscale. It's fine, but this was just an approach I used that I liked. Okay. It worked for me. And I would mix these colors together the same way I would mix paints. I would take dashes of red, blue, green. I would mix them together to create these different vibrations of color. Okay. And we'll watch that as it unfolds. However, while we're on, while we're, uh, while I have your attention, while we're watching this, I want to talk about career for a moment. Not only career, but to give you a little bit of a taste of one person's career and how it unfolded and the different twists and turns that it took and the things that I learned through the process of it. Okay. And pursuing a career in art, you might find yourself in the same situation. Maybe not, but, but it's very possible that you will. You might find that at certain points in your career, you need to take a little bit of a detour. You might need to try something else, or sometimes you'll need to um, find work for the sake of finding work, for the sake of eating and, and paying your bills, right? Because sometimes in any industry, be it accounting, art, uh, astrophysics, whatever the case might be, sometimes when the market is, is suffering a bit, like it is now, you might have to find yourself finding an alternative for a salary. However, I want to give you a little bit of a perspective on that because it can give you the wrong impression about your career when you need to make these little detours. And furthermore, you might be overlooking the value of doing this every now and then uh, when you feel like you're forced into doing it. And to give you an example, I wanted to be a cartoonist and a character designer. I wanted to be a traditional artist from the age of two onward. And I even made myself a little business card when I was five that said, professional Disney cartoonist. I, I mean that, literally. And I studied fine arts, and I studied uh, uh, classical animation in college and university, and then I unleashed myself on the industry. And I found a job in the gaming industry very early on, almost right out of school. In fact, I started working in the gaming industry before I even graduated. But that being said, that only lasted about a year. Because after about a year, it was I was unleashed on the industry at the same time that the that the entertainment industry, the visual arts industry, was taking a big U-turn. 3D started to become extremely popular, and a lot of traditional artists were starting to lose their jobs. And one of the main reasons for that was because 3D was very different than 2D at the time. 3D wasn't as as advanced and powerful as it is today, and it couldn't it couldn't recreate the organic and loose um, feeling of traditional art the way it can today. So um, it was kind of one world or the other type of idea. It was one skill versus another skill. And after about a year, a lot of the traditional artists that I worked with started getting laid off. And furthermore, because I was a rookie, because I was so new to the industry, I was at the bottom of the food chain. So for me to find work as a traditional artist was, uh, was very difficult. And it didn't take me long to realize, well, A, I've got to eat, so I've got to find whatever work I can get for the meantime, and B, I have to retrain myself. I have to learn a new skill. And logically, 3D was the way to go, right? But I didn't want to spend the next three years in school, so I picked up a, a, a beginner intermediate book on Maya, I picked it up at the bookstore, and I spent the next three, four months really, really, really grinding over this book. And it took you through the entire process of modeling, rigging, animation, texturing, lighting, so on and so forth, until I had a two, three-minute demo created, and I found work right off, right away. What's not on my CV, however, is the fact that during that period, I was working at Sprint Canada as a customer service agent, and I worked as a waiter at a couple of restaurants in Montreal. Okay. Yes, they were temporary. I didn't, they didn't hold on to them very long. I wasn't very committed to these positions, but they paid the bills. 
I also actually enjoyed them to a certain degree. I enjoyed waiting more than Sprint. I found that phone customer service was basically damage control. Okay, and that was my personal opinion of it. But, you know, I, I did well. I didn't slack off at my job. But the moment I was hired at a 3D studio to work as a 3D animator, I dropped that job like a hot potato. Okay, I, I walked out. I even remember dramatizing it to my friends. I took my name tag and I threw it over my shoulder. And I walked out, you know, <laughs> as if I was a hobo about to hit the road again, you know, and everybody laughed. And I made friends that I still have to this day. But that being said, um, I got into 3D animation. I, there was lots of work to be had. However, what I wasn't noticing over the years was the fact that 3D animation was evolving. It was starting to be able to catch. It was starting to catch up with traditional artists. And concept art was starting to become more and more popular. And it wasn't until... Although I continued to draw all the time because it was my passion, it was what I did, you know, I would do it for free type of thing. Um, uh, I was not realizing the fact that concept art was beca becoming more and more popular because 3D animation was starting to catch up with 2D art. And it wasn't until I saw a, a tutorial by a well-known concept artist known as Darkin, Who's also, his name is Mike Lim, but he's known in the industry as Darkin. I saw his tutorial, and two things dawned on me at the time. The first was the fact that he had an approach to teaching digital painting and concept art, because I remember I was more from the cartoonist background, in a way that made a lot of sense to me. It really clicked with me, and it really excited me, because he had a very trial and error, very intuitive approach to it. He would transform, he would move things around, he had a different way of playing with values that really spoke to me and really made it click immediately and I had all the Photoshop experience behind me to back it up but furthermore he was working in the industry as a concept artist there was work there and his characters were full-fledged art that could translate easily into 3d and it all of a sudden it clicked on me hey wait a minute I can do this and of course the rest is history I, I, I immediately went full force into concept art and, I, and I've been loving it since if I look back at my few years, for instance, of having to, you know, work at Sprint and work as a waiter and all of these things, I could have easily regarded that as wasted time. I could regard any job that wasn't art related, quote unquote, as wasted time. But if I really look at it, I actually gained some very valuable skills, not only working as a waiter, not only working at Sprint, but also working in 3D. I learned some very valuable skills that you wouldn't learn being an artist. For instance, how to talk to people, how to diffuse a situation, how to gain trust very quickly in a phone conversation when you're just talking to, to a complete stranger on the phone from somewhere at the other end of the world, right? And those are some valuable skills that I learned, some speaking skills when it came to phone customer service. And when I worked as a waiter, it's high energy, you're in shape because you're always on your feet, you're sweating, you're running around in and out of, in and out of the kitchen, that type of thing. It really got you, it taught me how to break the ice with people and really open up and warm up to people and I'll, I'll never regret that and furthermore working as a 3d animator I learned the, the study of light and texture the way many traditional artists don't and when I actually learned to incorporate the two together it took my art my traditional artwork to an entirely different level because I had an understand of how an understanding of how this traditional art translates into 3d so when I produce traditional art I know what a modeler and, and a texture artist and an animator can pull off and what they can't in terms of creating something for the industry okay and that of course led to me working as a director as well because I had the knowledge of both so never ever feel like you're wasting time everything is valuable and don't hold it against yourself if you have to take a detour every now and then All right, now that you've heard my life story, the next step that I'd like to, to um, attack is adding detail, adding some life, adding some overgrowth to this tree to make it feel more ancient and organic. And the way I decided to do that was to paint moss on it. So I chose a darker color, okay, a very low value, low saturation color, shape dynamics and other dynamics turned on, as well as opacity and flow set to 100. And there I create on a new layer, I just started scribbling it in, letting my brush squiggle off in many different directions. Because remember, moss is essentially overgrowth, right? It's essentially a, a, a fungus that grows across an object. And I put myself in the headspace of moss. How does moss think? Be the moss, I told myself. 
And moss essentially is looking for moisture. Like every other living organism on Earth, it's looking for life-sustaining nutrients. So I was thinking, where would moisture collect on a tree? Well, it, it sits on the top of the tree when it rains. It might also collect in, the, in little corners and folds. So any time where I found a fold, I, I felt it might be necessary to let the moss travel in. But then every now and then, it would break off and go off in its own direction. And maybe at certain points as well, I would have it break off in two spots, but then it would join together again. You know, it's always looking for a partner. It's looking for love. Moss is, you know what? Moss is just looking for love. And at the same time, I would let it maybe trail off around one side and grow back around to suggest that it's wrapping around these shapes. And then it would collect here where it found more moisture, that type of thing. And I just kept going in that direction. And the next step was to create a new layer and child connect that layer to my original one. And you just do that by holding down Alt and clicking between them. Now, everything that I draw here will only appear on areas that are already painted on the layer below it. And I chose a lighter value, a lighter value color. And I did use exactly the same technique, but now I'm starting to paint the light over it. And you notice here, I'm leaving a little bit of space because I'm taking into account that this is the lighting that's reflecting off of the surface, right? I'm using exactly the same technique. I just painted on the lighting on this moss. And I let that go all the way around the corner as such, okay? I, let it, I allow it to be random. I'm not totally anal about it, right? Because this is moss. And I painted it in like that. Then I take an eraser and I set it to, I turn off shape dynamics and I set my opacity and flow relatively low. And then I come in with my eraser tool and I erase it as it goes around because I'm creating a fall off exactly the same way you would do with, with any other lighting. And it creates that nice fall off. And that's it. So let's watch the moss. Now, one of the things I'd like to talk about at this point is your confidence in the industry. Um, and that's a very important topic. I've worked as a teacher, and as a teacher, I've very often been approached by students who would ask me the very honest and humble question, do I belong in this industry? Do I have the skill required to ever become a success? The reason these students are asking me this question is because very often they're in a class with other students that have a, that are technically stronger artists. They have a little bit more experience and practice than, than other people in the class, and they're comparing themselves, thinking them, thinking how weak they are in comparison to this other artist. And as such, am I really going to ever become a success in this industry? If you put that into, your, into the context of your own life, you might visit websites like conceptart.org or It's Art or CG Society or, or DeviantArt or whatever the case might be. And when you do, when you visit these sites, you'll be, you'll be smacked in the face with this splash page of 6,000 very talented artists. And your ego response to this is, well, unless I'm just as good or if not better than them, then they're going to get the job before I do. They're going to become successes uh, before I do. I'm, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. And that's wrong. You're actually fooling yourself. Furthermore, you're not, real, you're not seeing the big picture when it comes to growth, when it comes to uh, success and all of these things. If you look through the course of history, celebrities, and I'm not just talking about distant old history, I'm talking about recent history as well, what's happening as we speak. Very often there are certain artists, certain celebrities that are picked out of the mix. The same is with everything, right? There's always a, somebody that has the spotlight shone on them, some celebrity. If we look at distant history, we can look at artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and, and Bouguereau and Seurat and Monet and Degas and, and then getting a little bit more recent, we got Frazetta and we get, then we get Bobby Chu and Kay Sidera and, and uh, Andrew Jones and Sam Nielsen and blah, 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 this goes on, right? These awesome artists that everybody loves, that I love as well, of course. And when you look at them, very often you'll notice that younger artists might try to imitate or emulate or try to go in the same direction as that artist because in their head they've created the illusion that in order for them to become a success, their, the quality of their artwork has to be just as good if not better. So what better way to develop my skill than to imitate or emulate their particular art style? Okay. 
What you're not realizing, however, is that every single one of these artists, and that includes Leonardo da Vinci, that includes Michelangelo, that includes all of these classic artists, okay? All of them have created 10,000 crappy drawings. And what I mean by crappy drawings is, you know that box, that shoe box that's in your closet right now that has all those drawings you did t five, six years ago that you, were, you would be humiliated if anybody saw them because they're so crappy compared to what you do today? <laughs> you know that box I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, we all have that box. All of us. We have many boxes like that. There's a lot of artwork that I was, I'd be petrified to show the world because I'm so embarrassed on how bad and how weak they are. I have pictures at my sister's house. I do a, like a cartoon of my, of, I remember seeing a cartoon of my niece, Cyan, that I put up on the wall that I did maybe 10 years ago. And I looked at it and went, oh God, I can't believe that's there. And I immediately had to do her a new drawing to replace that old one because I was so ashamed of how bad I was back then. Leonardo da Vinci has those too. Sure he does. He's got hundreds of them. You think he just one day, you think the great Lord Almighty, the Lord of Art came down and handed him the magic paintbrush and he just produced masterpieces? No, of course not. He sucked. Leonardo da Vinci had a teacher. His father put him in, in a school with, with a great and, 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 and reputable art school in Italy for him to learn from. And it, before he took the school, before he studied in the school, he sucked. Okay? He sucked just as bad as you and I did. That's absolutely normal. Okay, but if you put yourself, if you compare yourself to everybody else in the industry, you might thinking you might be doing the same thing. You might be looking at that, thinking, "Oh God, I'm never going to hold up to that." You think that Leonardo da Vinci ever would have become the master he was? You think of Michelangelo or Bouguereau would have become the masters they they became if they were the only people that had that skill? No, he was surrounded by thousands of other extremely talented artists. If you don't believe me, go to the Louvre. There's there's hundreds of brilliant paintings, just as beautiful by artists you probably never even heard of. But he was a celebrity. He stuck out, right? So did Michelangelo. They stuck out. You know, they were big hot shots. It doesn't mean they were the only ones that were amazing. Now, it's not only that these other artists existed, but Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Bouguereau, Sarra, all of these artists needed to see and be exposed to brilliant art by other artists every day in order to have a point of reference, a goal, a, a, a way to move forward. They needed other opinions from other artists to compare to their own work in order to grow. And when you go visit a site like conceptart.org or, or any of these other sites, realize that the more brilliant artists exist, that the, the more brilliant artists exi exist, the better off you are. Because that means you can share your experiences with people online, your friends, your colleagues, and you can share in the experience of growing as an artist rather than sitting alone in your little office doing all your little silly sketches on your own without ever having the opportunity to share it and get other people's opinions. Without these other artists out there, you would, you would be alone. It would be a very lonely place. It would be a very unhappy place. You would create this brilliant work of art and never have anybody to share it with, right? What's the point in that? The whole, to me, one of the great joys is the fact that I, I, I am living in the internet age where I can post a picture online on a site like conceptart.org and get the feedback of 50 people that can give me all kinds of tips. I mean, I love that. The fact, the more people, the more opinions I get, the happier I am. I'm not trying to sit there saying I'm the one and only god of art. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm happy that I have, I'll always have a place to go with it. But realize your skills and realize your own qualities as an artist. Maybe it's storytelling. Maybe it's creativity. Maybe it's creature design. Maybe it's the art of drawing. Everybody's got their strengths and, we strengths and weaknesses, and everybody's got something to contribute. Now, uh, at this point, we have a tree and I want to paint leaves, millions and millions of little leaves onto this tree. However, before I approach the whole subject of leaves, I have to answer an important question. Do I or do I not have a life? Well, thankfully I do. So I'm going to have to shortcut, somehow shortcut, painting in all of these leaves uh, and still be able to, you know, enjoy, you know, a happy life with my children on the side. So that being said, this is where creating your own custom brushes comes in very handy because I don't want to spend the next six years painting a million individual leaves 
onto my tree, especially a tree with this kind of complexity to it. So, in order to create a brush, I'll show you. Create a new document, Control N, and I'm going to set this to, let's say, 500 by 500, and I'll keep the resolution relatively high, let's say about 200. Okay? It's going to have a white background as well. And here, I'm going to create a new layer, and on this layer, when I create my brush, I have to think to myself, how did I paint, how, what's the technique that I'm using to paint my, my tree with? Well, I used, for the blocking, I used that technique of painting in with a soft brush, okay, and erasing out the shape. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing. The only thing I need to, I need to take into account here is that in Photoshop, the only information that's important when it comes to creating a brush is the black and white information. Brushes are, uh, the color of your brush is dependent on what color you pick, but it's, it's not dependent on the color of the brush that you create. So for the brush, the only thing that's important is the black and white. Any black area is going to be an area that's um, considered the active area of the brush. So anything that's white is going to be considered transparency. It's non-active part of the brush. And any area that's black is going to be the active area of the brush. So in this case, it's only going to paint the leaves because the leaves are black. And I'm going to use my eraser tool to chisel out the shape of leaves. I could draw this by hand if I wanted to, but I don't think it's entirely necessary because these leaves are going to be small, so this will do the job. And I'm going to chisel out the shape of these leaves. And I'm going to give them slightly varying sizes and slightly varying angles as well, because I know I want these leaves to scatter out in all, the, in all directions. Okay, turn my opacity up a little bit. That means that I don't have to use as many brush strokes to create these brushes, to create these shapes. And I want to vary the sizes and shapes a little bit because I want these leaves to go in all different directions. So this one I might, I'm going to select it and then transform. I'm going to move the pivot point over so that it pivots from this angle and I hit enter when I'm good. And maybe this one I'll move over a little bit. I'm going to transform, move the pivot point over, turn it around a little bit, and then shrink it down because I want these to be varying sizes, small, medium, and large. And then once I'm good with that, once I'm happy with that, I just go into Edit, Define Brush Preset. And here I can name it. And generally, I like to initial mine, just so I know I can distinguish mine from the those of others. So Adam Duff, AD, uh, Leaf Brush. Okay. And I'm happy with that. Now when I go into my actual um, when I go into my actual drawing and I open my, my brush palette, if I look at the bottom, bingo, there it is. And here's my brush. And it's got that nice soft fall off, the same way I've done everything else. But as we can see here, it doesn't quite work. It's they're all uniform, they're all facing the same direction. That's not the, that's not the effect that I want. I want these to be scattered and random. So I open up, this is where I go into my settings here, and the first one is shape dynamics. I want to be able to control, I want some to be bigger and some to be smaller. However, I want to go into these settings and adjust a few things. For instance, I don't necessarily want to have tiny little leaves next to big, huge leaves. That's too drastic. So I'm going to click on my shape dynamics, and the minimum diameter here, I'm going to pull it up a little bit. So there's only a small, small increment between smallest and largest brush. So that's a little bit better. Now I can get slight variations, but nothing too drastic. Maybe a little bit less. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I don't want them all to face the same direction. I want them to rotate. So that's where angle jitter. I'm still in shape dynamics and I'm just going to hit angle jitter. And as you can see, it jitters the direction as I'm painting. But I have to have a, I want to have a little bit more control over that, so I'm going to hit direction. Just so I know that the direction that I'm painting will have an impact on how these leaves paint. We're getting closer. The only other thing I want to add here is other dynamics. That way I can have ones that are more opaque and ones that are darker. One of the ones that are lighter and ones that are darker. And I, like that, I can scatter up my brush and create some nice organic shapes. And at that point, the only thing I need to worry about is just changing the color. Let's say I want to make them orange. Or what, maybe I want to make them red. Okay. Now when it comes to the lighting, when I'm lighting these, all I have to do is create a new layer, use the same brush, and just choose a higher value. That's all. 
and paint where I want the light to go. And just scatter them out, create some nice bush shapes. And then I can adjust the color, control U, I can add saturation, I can lower the value, I can do all that fun stuff. Okay? So that's essentially it. So let's get to it. Now what I'd like to talk about now uh, relates very closely to what I discussed uh, before the last uh, demonstration with texture brushes. Okay? And that's the whole subject of stepping outside of yourself when it comes to your own artwork. Um, what you might not realize, you wouldn't realize, you couldn't possibly realize unless I told you, which I'm telling you right now, is that I actually did f uh, three or four different versions of leaves. I tried three or four different iterations of these leaves um, before I fell on this approach. Now, I tried a big umbrella-like canopy that consumed the entire upper portion of the uh, of the uh, of the image. I tried weeping willow type strands of hair that came down with flower, flower petals in it. I tried uh, big thick bunches of leaves where I actually painted in and rendered out um, uh, each individual leaf with specularity and all of these different things. And in each case what I felt I was doing was killing something. There was something about this painting where I had reached at this point that I was really enjoying but I actually didn't even see it myself until I made this realization later on at this particular phase in the painting. Every time I painted in these leaves I felt like I was I was weighing down my painting and killing a lot of this a lot of the spirit of this original painting that I was really enjoying. I was going a direction that I really enjoyed with it and I didn't want to kill that. So I was very careful with how I approached this part. Now I wouldn't have made that realization if I kept staring at this image and kept trying different ideas. I had to put myself into the headspace of another artist in essence, which relates very much to what I was talking about in the last part. And I researched a lot, I was looking up different artists and stuff like that until I felt I saw something that spoke to me. And in this particular case, I fell on the work of Kea Sidera from Imaginism Studios. Okay, And of course, I've always been a fan of her work. I love her work. Um, and when I looked, not all of her pieces are like this, but in some of her pieces, one of the things that I find really, really strikes me, something she's really magical with, is her power of simplicity. I personally, I mean, I could be completely wrong because I don't know her personally, but I would, when I look at her artwork, I think of somebody who's very shy and delicate. Okay, somebody who's very shy and delicate. And in her approach with her paintings, very often, she can create a tiny little delicate world, like a, like a little hand-carved character, where it's an entire little world in this delicate little piece. Okay, It's the opposite, the polar opposite of show-offy. It's very simple, it's very shy, and at the same time it's very simplistic. So it was that key word that I took out of it. It was simplic simplicity. And I took that out of her work because there was something in it that spoke to me. And when I looked at my, my tree, I t there was no leaves on it, I looked at my tree and I thought to myself, what if I abandon this whole idea of having a big three-dimensional form and I approach it a little bit more two-dimensionally. And instead of approaching these leaves as these three-dimensional bunches, I could approach it more in a patternly way, more of a mosaic, where it's delicate. It's almost like these little tufts of cotton candy or something like that. And as soon as I did that, and I approach these leaves in terms of the pattern because the leaves, the, the power of these branches is the fact that they create this very neat graphic pattern. I do the same thing with the leaves. When I did that, I immediately captured something. It made sense to me. And when I painted them in, it, it, it worked first shot. It took me one shot to do it and I just painted in this, these different patterns of leaves and it really worked. I, I brought in the element of foliage into this tree to add that new dimension into it, but at the same time I was maintaining the pattern-like delicateness of this image. And it was spot on. It also gave me a lot of negative space. I wasn't weighing my painting down under this big heavy canopy of leaves. I was keeping it light and innocent and fun. Okay, I couldn't have done that unless I stepped out of my own headspace. And this is something that I encourage you to do as well. Remember something. You are one person. You have your own experiences, your own brain, you have your own way of formulating and putting together information, right? You have your own way to approach a painting, which in essence is what's going to define you as an artist. It's going to define your own style if it hasn't already, right? In fact, it does from a very early age, right at the beginning. 
but you need to spend those years to develop that style into something that's more technically uh, something that's technically stronger however you are not the only person in this universe who has a brain who has creativity okay and you can if you project your own feelings like an actor would take on the character take on the role of another person okay be them a murderer or a lover or or a romantic or something like that they can take themselves out of their own body and put themselves into the headspace of somebody else okay and what I did by visualizing how Kay thinks what is her personality I took on the personality of her in my own artwork I wasn't imitating her artwork of course because if I tried to do that basically what I would end up with is something that was that looked like her work but wasn't as good because I'll never be as good as her at what she does it is her own mind I, I'm not her I'm not psychic right but what I can do is project my own feelings onto her work how do I feel when I look at it and furthermore how does she feel when she's producing it and by doing that and, and coming back to my own artwork I put myself in an entirely different headspace and very often your headspace is the most important element on how you approach a painting you can you can look at exactly the same artwork at, that somebody else is looking at it and have two completely different interpretations of it because you have your own way of interpreting things you're an individual okay you're different than everybody else so you'll have your own own way of interpreting it and by having an, the influence of somebody else's mind and using your own interpretation and applying it to your own artwork you can find ideas and approach your artwork in ways you never would have thought of in a million years okay so this is something that I very much encourage you to do and that plays a very important role that connects very closely to the whole element of realizing that you need others out there you need other brilliant artists out there to grow okay so don't limit your mind to your own thought process give yourself a chance to be somebody else for a moment and think like somebody else